anesthesiologists and intensivists across Europe and around the world are providing essential, life-saving care that has an impact on all areas of medicine. In 2020, the importance of working as a unified global community to maintain the very highest standards of practice and patient safety grow ever more clear. Now, this community is coming together virtually to enhance knowledge, catch up on innovative techniques and learn the latest guidelines. It's Euro Anesthesia 2020 and we're Euro Anesthesia TV. Welcome to Euro Anesthesia 2020 and to our virtual Euro Anesthesia TV studio. Now, as Europe's largest professional community of anesthesiologists comes together online to share information, learn new techniques and to network, we're here to bring you some of the highlights. From interviews with plenary speakers to session previews and updates on key ASAIC projects. We'll be visiting hospitals doing great work in the field around the world as well. Today we hear from this year's Sir Robert McIntosh lecturer, Professor Daniela Filipescu. We visit Mater University Hospital Dublin and discuss a session on improving maternal safety with Dr. Noala Lucas and Professor Carolyn Weiniger. We'll also stop by the Heart and Diabetes Centre, North Rhine, Westphalia. We discuss ECMO with Professor Giacomo Griselli. And finally, catch up with Professor Kai Zakharovsky to hear about intensive care and Azaik's name change. It's the centrepiece of every Euro anesthesia meeting and important in highlighting the biggest issues of the day in anesthesiology. Well, this year's Sir Robert McIntosh lecturer is former ESAIC president, Professor Daniela Filipescu. Professor Filipescu, many thanks for joining us. I wonder if you could start by telling us what is the title of your lecture and how did you come to choose it? The title of the lecture is Safe and Diverse Celebrate Our Strengths. And I was inspired uh, by Sir uh, McIntosh, uh, who was one uh, of the first to advocate for uh, patient uh, safety. Of course, this year we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Helsinki Declaration. Now, what does that mean to, to you and also to the anesthesiology community? This anniversary um, provided um, uh, a timely opportunity to uh, build on the uh, global efforts on uh, uh, patient safety. Uh, we convened this year in March a policy uh, summit for patient safety to raise the policymakers' awareness of patient safety. Has the sort of increased prominence of intensive care medicine and of course the role of the anesthesiologist in COVID-19 affected things? This year uh, showed I may say, uh, the rest of the world, why we are here. We are here to save lives and we are made for this uh, uh, moment and we have to take this opportunity and uh, reposition our uh, specialty for the future. You're asking uh, anesthesiologists to celebrate their strengths. What would you say are the strengths of anesthesiologists and why is it important to do so? We have a vast array of knowledge and skills in the management of acutely ill. We are champions in uh, um, teamwork and uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. We are leaders in patient safety and we advocate for uh, gender equality and uh, equal opportunities for everybody. Professor Filipescu, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the kind invitation. Inspiring words there from Professor Filipescu. Do make sure to watch that lecture. Now, the effect of anesthesia on cancer recurrence and metastasis has long been a subject for discussion, but the Mater University Hospital Dublin is taking this research to the next level. Let's take a look.
we're going to look at lung cancers and colorectal cancer. Cancer biology is extremely complex, so I think there is still going to be a lot of work to do to test a theory. This is a crucially important question and in the event of positive findings, the potential to improve perioperative care of cancer patients going into the future is immense. Euroanesthesia TV is brought to you from the fully virtual Euroanesthesia 2020, featuring interviews with key speakers and updates about the scientific programme presented in this meeting. We've also travelled the world to bring you insights into the global field of anesthesiology and intensive care. You'll find us on the virtual meeting platform as well as online and on social media. We'll bring you a new episode each day of the meeting and make sure to click through for much more. Next, let's hear from Dr. Noala Lucas and Professor Carolyn Weiniger. They're participating in a session on improving maternal safety and they've given us a quick preview of what to expect. Hi everyone, my name is Carolyn Weininger from Tel Aviv, Israel and I'm the chair of the Obstetric Anesthesiology Subcommittee and I'm here with my friend and colleague Nula Lucas from London and we're here to talk about the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care programme of our subcommittee. Um, what do we expect to see in this programme? We've got some fantastic speakers, some fantastic sessions. I think with a huge focus on maternal safety, we're looking at the organisational aspects of maternal safety and we've got people like uh, my colleague Jim Bamber from the UK talking about the Embrace inquiry. We've got Marion Knight from the same inquiry and from the US we've got Brian Bateman who are real experts on the organisational aspects, the things we can do to innovate for maternal safety. And alongside that, we've got some fantastic clinical lectures, um, yourself included, talking about key elements of clinical care that can really make a difference to maternal safety. So the ESA has put together an interactive programme. So although you'll be listening to pre-recorded um, lectures, during every session, there'll be an opportunity to put your questions to the speakers who will be joining us and to have those questions answered. Um, we'll also have one live panel where we'll be talking about the fetus and drugs in pregnancy. So we're really lucky that you're going to be reviewing the year in literature. And I'm sure when you were given this task, you weren't expecting um, this type of literature to be reviewing. Can you give us a little highlight of uh, what we'll be hearing, the top picks of uh, publications in the last year? I've obviously had to include something about COVID. I haven't, hopefully haven't let it dominate. But I've tried to choose papers that I think have some personal resonance for my own practice. Things that have really made me think, gosh, you know, should I do this differently? Should I alter my practice in some way? So I hope everyone enjoys the papers I've chosen. Um, it's certainly been fun choosing them. Thanks, Nula. It was so great to chat to you. Really looking forward to our exciting conference for all of us. And if you haven't registered, there's still time to do so. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Make sure to catch that session for all the latest on maternal safety. Now to Germany and the Heart and Diabetes Centre, North Rhine-Westphalia. Anesthesiologists there are some of the best in the world in providing care for patients undergoing high-risk cardiothoracic and vascular procedures. The power behind our team is the 
commitment, the integrity and the passion for high-risk patients drives us to train others and also ourselves and we will continue to set standards in the future. Great work there from HDZ NRW, especially in providing new options for paediatric patients. Now to discuss an important session looking at ECMO and where it should happen. It's Professor Giacomo Griselli. ECMO is becoming more and more popular until 2009, I mean, until the H1N1 pandemics. ECMO was applied basically only in a very limited number of centers in, in Europe and in, and in the US. And after the H1N1 pandemic and after the publication of some randomized control trials, we have understood that ECMO is a very effective um, tool uh, for the rescue of severe hypoxemia to allow protective ventilation in ERDS patients and ultimately to improve the outcome of the patient. Until now, we, we've been told that ECMO should be applied only in experienced centers, in referral centers. And, uh, but, but now we see new ECMO centers coming up every day. And it's very important to listen to different opinions of the experts, whether ECMO should be really restricted to referral centers or it could be, let's say, more, a more widespread treatment applied in, in different centers. In, in, in worldwide. The, the, the first expert will be Professor Paolo Pelosi, and he will be talking about, should I always transport my patient to an ECMO center? There are studies showing that referring patients to ECMO centers, even if they don't go on ECMO, can be associated with improved out patient outcome. And the second presentation is by Dr. Sharon Einaf, She's an expert of methodology of science, and she's also working in, on, the, on the field in Israel. And her topic is only ICU or other settings. She will try to do a step forward on where should we apply ECMO, only in referral centers or even outside the ICU. So you should really come to this session because uh, the experts are great. They will present different viewpoints on the application of ECMO in different settings and because ECMO is becoming more and more popular and we really need to know which is the best environment to, to apply ECMO and in which patients. So please come to the session. The European Society of Anesthesiology is now the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. For a closer look at why the society changed their name and the importance of this change, not only now, but for the future of the profession, let's find out more from Mosaic President, Professor Kai Zakharovsky. <music> Professor Zakharovsky, many thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. So could you tell us, first of all, how does intensive care fit into anesthesiology as a whole? Well, uh, intensive care medicine, is uh, part of the training to become an anesthesiologist. And many of us are practicing both. Uh, within Europe, uh, it's about 70% of the patients being treated on intensive care are treated by anesthesiologists. How has COVID-19 really highlighted the importance of intensive care medicine? The founder of intensive care was an anesthesiologist named uh, Dr. Ibsen. And he had this brilliant idea to uh, ventilate these patients by hand. And thousands of students helped him in the treatment of uh, polio patients. And lots of them survived after that. So that was the beginning. Now we have a new epidemic, uh, which is called COVID-19. Without anesthesiology, lots of patients could not be treated in these uh, difficult times. So how will this affect the future of the society and its activities? We will focus more on education. We will increase our engagement in research in the field of intensive care, but also put far more effort into patient safety on intensive care units. And finally, our exams will also cover more and more of the field of intensive care. 
Well, we wish you all the best with this new future. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Zakharovsky. Thank you very much and all the best. Together for patient safety and health, a very fitting statement from the Isaic. And looking forward to a bright future for the newly titled Isaic, as the role of intensive care is highlighted more and more. Well, that's the end of our first show, but as Euroanesthesia continues, there's plenty more to come from us here at Euroanesthesia TV. Tomorrow, we look at the pros and cons of awake intubation, discuss gender equity in anesthesiology, and look at the Helsinki Declaration 10 years on. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>